Good afternoon. Come on, guys. You make me work so hard. Good afternoon. So, for anybody who doesn't know, I'm Alan Leshner. I'm the chief executive here at AAAS, the executive publisher of Science and our other journals, and it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you to another fabulous event in this Neuroscience and Society series that we do in partnership with the Dana Foundation. The Dana Foundation is probably the leading philanthropic organization interested in promoting neuroscience, but particularly neuroscience as it relates to the rest of society. And they support a lot of research kinds of activities, but they also support this kind of activity. And today we have a particularly unusual one. I don't know how many, um, how many times there have been sort of sessions for the public, for the scientific community, focusing on the intersection between the arts and the brain. And this is sort of a multimodal event. Our speakers are experts in the brain and, um, and, and art and how the brain reacts to the art. In addition to that, we have a distinguished discussant who is, in fact, a well-known and well-experienced museum director. Then we have a cellist to entertain us during the reception area, and then we'll have a reception. And the format we're gonna use is speaker, speaker, discussing as a speaker, uh, followed by letting them have at each other for just a little bit, and then we'll open it up to the audience for questions. For those of you who've not been here before, you know what a question is, right? It's short, it doesn't have a preamble, your voice goes up at the end, <laughs> got it? And I will ruthlessly enforce that definition for all of you. Um, I'm particularly pleased that we're having this session. First of all, I'm a neuroscientist myself by background, although I haven't done any respectable science in many, many years. But um, when I was, a graduate student, there was a very distinguished psychologist, neuroscientist at Johns Hopkins named Stuart Hulse, who was interested in learning and how the brain processed learning and memory. He got interested in music, the brain, and how the brain processed music, and he was sort of treated like, what are you, weird? You know, why are you taking up this unusual topic? And I think what's happened over time is that this topic has obviously, from the size of the crowd here, uh, generated a large amount of public interest, but it's also generated a great deal of scientific interest as well. And it's, it's, uh, so it's really a nice topic for a neuroscience and society series. It should appeal to the scientists, to society and to the people in the arts. So I look forward to a, a terrific evening. Let me start by introducing the first speaker, and I understand you have bios in the little program that you were given, so I'll, I won't go through that again, but first speaker is Christopher Tyler, who's the director of the Smith Kettlewell Brain Imaging Center at the Smith Kettlewell Eye Research Institute in San Francisco. He works on visual perception and visual neuroscience. He's contributed to the study of the brain processing of form, symmetry, flicker, motion, color, stereoscopic depth perception has developed steps, tests for the diagnosis of retinal and optic nerve diseases with great pleasure. Let me give you Christopher Tyler. Well, thank you very much. It's a, certainly a pleasure to be here, able to address this distinguished audience. So uh, my topic is art, visual art and, and the brain. Uh, I want to start at the beginning with the, the wellsprings of art, uh, which go back uh, millennia to the cave art that we're uh, 
most people are familiar with, uh, distressing the extraordinary subtlety uh, uh, of the expression that was that was the uh, these artists were capable of so many years not 3000 years ago but 30000 years ago i mean the mind boggles at the conditions that they were working in at that time but i i want to point out other aspects of cave art that are not so well known more uh, more abstract approaches to art uh, here a nexus of parallel curves. I don't know if you see what it is. If I over overlay an outline, we see that it's actually a bull's head, which now I think you can all see in that drawing. This, so evidently, visual illusions were a topic back 30,000 years ago. Uh, but an another aspect that I want to focus on is that tremendous power of expression that, that these artists were capable of. Here, the, uh, this phalanx of uh, she lions, of lionesses, uh, uh, really, really draw you into the scene. You really feel the power of these creatures and the, the intensity of their glare. And this, this is the topic I want to focus on for most of this talk, which goes by the name of in, in the uh, neuroscience field of embodied cognition. The, and the, I'm talking about the sense of, of drawing you in and making you really feel the quality of the paintings. I'm going to give you various examples as I go through. Here, starting with one of the most iconic paintings in the history of art, Botticelli's Birth of Venus. But I hope that you feel the uh, uh, the floating sense of these figures on the left floating in the zephyrs of the breezes across the scene and the Venus floating in on the half, half shell, on the, on the scallop shell here. So you really get a sense, uh, a bodily sense of uplift from this painting uh, that uh, I think is the reason for its, uh, or one of the key reasons for, for its iconic status. Now we can we can take the same concept in reverse and and look at this uh, painting from the 17th century by a female artist Artemisia Gentileschi who's been gaining a lot more recognition recently than she had earlier on. Uh, she's showing the exact opposite. I mean, the scene she's depicting is the exact opposite. You really feel the thrust of the sword as it cuts through. The, the neck of General Holofernes, and the, uh, perhaps we could have the lights down a little, uh, the blood spurting out from the neck. You feel the thrust of the arms downward. You feel the thrust of the general's hand upwards as he pushes up on, on the maidservant. I'm, I'm expressing these bodily because the, the sense of appreciating this painting is, is a real bodily sense. It's embodied cognition. This is what is meant by embodied cognition, that you really feel it in your body. You can't really appreciate the work unless you feel it in your own body. Project into the painting your, the bodily sensations. The same, uh, same sort of feel comes out of um, more modern art. Here, abstract expressionist painting by Jackson Pollock, and again, you really, could we have the lights down a little further, please? These aren't projecting quite as well as they are on my screen. Uh, you really feel the action. Uh, he, he, what he was famous for was splashing the paint across the canvas. And you really feel that action if you, if you get into this painting. Uh, the, the first look, it's just, it's just a kind of uniform texture. But as you get into it, the, the appreciation of it has to do with understanding the, the dynamism, the energy of the, th the, thr the paint as he's throwing it across the canvas. So again, the, this is the embodied cognition aspect of the painting. So let me go through a couple of points about embodied cognition. It is a term with many me meanings. Um, I'm focusing on the meaning in the application of, of art appreciation. 
And in this context, it usually meant, means, as I say, the sense of feeling the artwork in relation to your own body. And it's um, often associated with what are called mirror neurons in the brain, which are neurons that respond similarly when watching an action and when performing the same action. So there was this discovery by Rizzolatti that the same neurons could be activate, activated by what uh, behaviorally are two very different um, processes, but they have the same uh, conceptual underlay. Now, I want to point out that the, this uh, concept of mirror neurons or mirror circuitry implies bidirectional transmission of information. So, um, performing the action requires uh, the information to flow out from the control centers to the limbs in order to perform the action. But observing the action requires information to flow inward from the, the image or scene into the control centers for the observed action. So that bidirectional flow is what's uh, captured as a, a similar concept in this idea of mirror neurons. And it's this that gives the extra vividness to the aesthetics of art appreciation. So following up on this uh, mirroring concept, <laughs> this is uh, a portrait by Norman Re Rockwell of himself painting a portrait as he leans over and you sort of feel that lean as he stares into the mirror to see his, the image of his own face in, that he's capturing on the canvas. And in fact, there are five other images. So there are a total of eight self-portraits in this one self-portrait. So it's, a, it's in a deeply reflexive painting that helps to illustrate this concept I'm talking about. And now, um, here, here is... Here is a, a more surreal approach, depiction of a similar idea of the uh, subject viewing himself in the mirror, but instead of being an inverted view looking back at himself, it's an uninverted view of, of what he is viewing. So this evokes to me the idea of him viewing his own mental processes, which I tried to illustrate here with the overlay <laughs> of his... Uh, neural activity in his own brain and his, his mirrored brain. So this then leads me to the question of what, what is the activity in the brain? And here from a study from the Sereno lab is a rather good illustration of, of this activity. So this, the task here in, in the scanner is the subject is reaching, physically reaching for objects. Um, and the activation is, is fairly widespread. On the left, uh, the, these are the lateral surfaces of the brain. On the right are the medial, the inner surfaces of the, of the two hemispheres. And you see there's various centers. I'm not going to go through the terminology. But you see there are various centers activated by this task. So this is the, the, the actual task. They, also, they compared this with observing the same task without moving. And they found that a certain number of areas were similarly activated. And so these corresponded to the activation of the single neurons for the same pair of tasks. And these can, the, the ones that are co-activated can be regarded as the mirror regions of the human cortex. Um, so I've, I've circled the ones that are similarly activated, although there is a an asymmetry because it's, it's only one arm reaching, so it's the other hemisphere that's showing the activation. If it were the other arm, it would be the, the non-activated hemisphere would be activated, so it would match. So that's the mirror neuron aspect or, or mirror, mirror region uh, from fMRI scanning. What's interesting to me is the opposite case which is going on in the, on the medial surfaces, on the inner side of the brain, where you see that all the areas that were activated in the actual reaching are not activated. There's virtually no activation 
on the medial surface in the observation condition. And this fits with the idea that the medial parts of the brain tend to be the ones that encode more personal, more, more uh, self aspects of the thought processes. And, and so these regions strongly differentiate, strongly encode whether it is your action or somebody else's action. They're the opposite of mirror neurons. And uh, so that's a, a, an interesting uh, reversal of the concept. So um, I'm, I'm going back and forth between neuroscience and art. This is an artist's exploration of the nature of the brain, Leonardo da Vinci in the 15th and early 16th centuries. You're probably familiar with these, these very analytic drawings of the inside, of, probably the first of the inside of the human skull. Um, what, what interested me exploring this is that he also depicted the brain in some lesser known drawings. Here's in an exploded diagram, somewhat cartoonish view as of the, um, uh, of the, the nerves connecting to the brain. Uh, but an even less known drawing of the cerebral hemispheres themselves, which is rather accurate drawing, so that he, he alternates between uh, high accuracy and not such high accuracy. So this is an artist's view, uh, uh, probably the first depiction of the human brain. Um, now, coming forward to the 20th century, uh, and another way of exploring it is, is by a technique used in art schools, which is to do blindfolded drawing. So you, you draw without uh, being able to see what it is you're drawing. And uh, th this is from a series by an artist called Claude Heath of uh, Buddha. And what interests me is the contrast, how, how it seems to contain two processes, both the literal depiction of the Buddha's face and a strong sense of the movements, of the drawing movements, as the artist reaches to try and uh, capture the, the, the facial image. And I think you get, get a kind of dual view from these of, of both the in, in, ingoing um, image quality of the face that's sort of half captured, and the output quality of the hand attempting to do its job. So uh, this, this brings me to the question of, of what the brain is doing during these actual drawing processes. And this is, uh, this leads to a, a, the question asked by, uh, the question we can ask, can we harness the power of drawing to drive brain plasticity plasticity and enhance memory? Can, can we look at the learning process involved in such uh, drawing processes? And this is a, a study uh, con conducted by my colleague, Laura Likova, who is with us in the audience, I'm happy to say. And she, she felt that the best way to answer this question was to use blindness as a model uh, of the of the system to again dissociate the visual processes from the the learning of the drawing processes. So in order to do this, uh, she had to develop a system that could be used in an fMRI scanner to 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 uh, encapture to in, sorry to capture the drawing trajectory. So this system allows her to explore both uh, visual and tactile drawings to capture the drawing trajectory and to analyze it uh, in detail uh, both uh, behavioral and, and kinematic aspects. Um, and if you could, this is the subject just before they're uh, sent into the scanner with a gantry supporting a drawing pad and a capture system. So in in order to 
study the learning of drawing, she did this in congenitally blind individuals. These are people who've never had any sight. They've, there's no, been no visual input to their brain their entire life. Uh, so it's, it's a big challenge to, to train them to draw, uh, to draw effectively. This process involves um, exploring tactile images. These are raised line tactile images. They, they explore with a finger. Here is a boot and a, a face. And um, after training them for a week, she trained she, she had to explain to these congenitally blind individuals what it meant to draw. They, none of them had, a, they, they'd heard of drawing, they didn't know what it meant to capture a three-dimensional object in a line drawing and train them to do it accurately. And uh, this, this slide show, shows a movie of their ability to draw these two images that I showed you in the previous slide. The boot on the left. This is, this is in real time. This is imagery captured in the fMRI scanner as they drew after uh, one, this particular case, after they'd been trained for, to accurately draw. So you can see that they're not just generic images. They really capture the features of the images that uh, uh, had been learned by uh, tactile exploration. So the, the kind of activation that she found with, uh, uh, as a, uh, during this training, uh, as a result of this training, is shown here. This is a pre-training activation on the medial surface. And you see there's activation in the motor area and a little bit in what would be the visual area. These are congenitally blind, so they don't have a visual area per se, uh, but uh, there is some, some activation where it would have been. Now, if we look at the focus on that uh, V1 region and look at it post-training, you see that the training procedure produced dramatic enhancement of the activation, very specific to the primary visual cortex, or what would have been the primary visual cortex in these congenitally blind subjects. It's, it's essentially unused cortex. It's got no uh, function in, in a congenitally blind person, but here, apparently, it's, it's able to be plastically engaged for, for use as an accurate, uh, perhaps, sketch pad, neural sketch pad of the image to be drawn. And this, uh, this activation was task-specific so on the right, it's comparing the act activation for the exploration phase in blue, for this memory draw, which is what's shown on the left in, in red, and for just scribble. And you see it's, uh, only, the activation is only uh, enhanced for the interactive process of the memory drawing. So that's, that's a, a remarkable form of, of rapid neuroplasticity induced by this training procedure. It's, it's called, it, it involves several levels of, of analysis and it's called cognitive kinesthetic training. Um, so I also want to show how this kind of training affects a, a visual brain, a, a brain of a, a normally sighted person. So this, this is uh, showing the lateral views at the top and the medial views at the bottom. If I activate the movie, you see this is uh, just viewing drawings. And you see there's a certain amount of activation, a little bit in the uh, occipital lobe, the, the visual area, and a little bit in the frontal lobe, which is the executive control area. Um, this, this is the activation from drawing from memory. And you see this is dramatically larger. So that, again, the process of drawing, uh, having learned to draw, is, is uh, greatly enhanced in, by this process of drawing from memory relative to simply observing the image. 
So, uh, so looking, looking again at, at artistic depictions of the creative process, here's the act of creation itself. I'm sure you all know this image very well. God creating, we see the transmission of life to the lifeless clay is what this is intending to depict. Now you all know this, this painting, right? How many of you know what God is cradling in his left arm? Hands up. No. So he's cradling Eve, who apparently he's, he's already conceptualized as he's creating Adam. So we can think of this uh, swath of figures around him as his thought processes that he's conceptualizing the Eve that he's going to be creating after he creates Adam. So I thought that was an interesting observe. I, I just noticed this. It's, it's, I've never, not seen it written about in any art books. Here's a, another a dramatic depiction of God that you may be less familiar with. I was, yeah, I'm fine. Um, and I, again, I'm, I'm using this to illustrate embodied cognition. You just feel as though you have to go, I'm going to create the sun and the moon. You know, it's a, such a dramatic gesture. You feel it in your own body. This is embodied cognition, is the way you're appreciating this gesture. Another form of gesture here is, is, is Michelangelo's depiction of the prophet Jeremiah, clearly not a, a dramatic uh, action. He's looking very depressed. Jer Jeremiah is famous for his lamentations. He's clearly deeply meditative and uh, soulful here. So but we, we get a sense of that aspect. So embodied cognition extends beyond simply action to the uh, transmission, the, the feeling of the expression of emotions from paintings. In fact, that's one of the things they're, they're best known for. Um, by the way, this, this illustration was copied by Rodin and, and probably was involved in his, his conceptualization of the, of the thinker. So it has a, a long his art historical association. Um, so where are emotions in, encoded in the brain? Well, Leonardo had a go at that too. And he, he uh, worked in the inner parts of the brain, not just the cortical surface, but the inner regions, which in his hands was mainly the ventricles, but in, in fact is the limbic system of the brain which uh, is depicted here in, in, in two views. The limbic system is, as, as best we understand it, where you actually feel the emotions, the flow of neural fluence or neural activity through this structure is what it is to feel emotion. And I show you this not only as, as a neuroanatomical neuro uh, specification, but also as a, an artistic, it's a, to me it's a, a, a natural sculpture. It's a, it's a very interesting sculptural form that nature has based. And perhaps even as an inducement for your limbic system to recognize itself as you see possibly for the first time the form of the limbic system within the brain and, and get a, a sense of a resonance with it in your own brain. So let me show you a couple of other <coughs> depictions. Maybe, maybe not entirely a positive resonance. <laughs> uh, here, here a, a very sort of a chrome, chrome plated look at the <laughs> limbic system. And here's in, an artistic depiction of it as a looming creature has its own vibrant life. So the limbic system as art object. So the, there's an interesting study of the activation of the limbic system by Ishuzu and Zeki. And the, what they did was to ask subjects to make a judgment between two, a series of pairs of images, which 
was the most beautiful. So they had to, to make an aesthetic judgment. And as a control study, they also had them judge which was brighter, so no, a non-aesthetic judgment. And the activation they found uh, very much lit up these inner parts of the brain, the limbic system, also some of the, the basal ganglia, and a little bit of the frontal cortex, the, the uh, lower parts, the ventral parts of the frontal cortex, uh, been strongly associated with, with positive emotions. So these, these are then the inner areas of the brain that ex help us to feel and express emotions uh, explored in a neuroscientific context. So, so that's my story. Let me just summarize the conclusions of, of w where I've led you. The art accesses some of the most advanced processes of human intuitive analysis and expressivity, that a key form of aesthetic appreciation is through embodied cognition, the ability to project oneself as an agent in the depicted scene, that such higher mental function is accessible to neuroscience imaging techniques, and that the project, this projective capability engages not just the established cortical regions of the mirror neuron system, but an array of subcortical limbic and basal ganglia structures that I just demonstrated to you. Uh, that learning and performing visual art, such as drawing, has the power to enhance memory and, to, and, and spatial cognition, even in the blind. And thus we see that art evokes a wealth of experiences that can form a fruitful basis for future neuroscience ex ex uh, investigations. Thank you very much. That was great. Does so somebody want to make the slide thingy work? Good. <laughs> That's a technical term spoken by a scientist. Uh, that was wonderful. I'm having an embodied cognition as we speak. Um, the second speaker uh, will speak about hearing as opposed to visual processes. Nina Krauss is the Hugh Knowles Professor of Communication Sciences, Neurobiology and Physiology, and Otolaryngology at Northwestern University. She directs the Auditory Neuroscience Laboratory. She and her team investigate the neurobiology of speech and music perception and learning associated brain plasticity cross-sectionally and longitudinally. Dr. Krauss. Thank you. Please. everybody. Um, I'm very happy to be uh, speaking with you. You know, there's some chairs in front if uh, folks want to come up. Um, so I was supposed to say there are additional <laughs> seats. <laughs> come on up. These are projected. I sort of didn't say it. This is really cool in here. And uh, I think it's an embodied cognition through the speech. All right then, so, uh, so music, language, and the brain. So when we learn things, our nervous system, something has to happen in the brain, right? Um, so you know, here is uh, how I started out, sticking needles in bunny rabbit brains, and uh, looking at how uh, you know, the, the bunny is gonna respond to a sound, and then when the bunny learns that the sound means something, the neural activity changes, and so, uh, this is something that we can easily do in animal models, looking at activity of single neurons, but how do we access <laughs> this learning in humans, right? I mean, how do we look at learning, biological learning in humans? And so our approach is one where, of course, as I'm talking with you now, the nerves in your brain that respond to sound are giving off electricity, and we can capture those electrical events with scalp electrodes. And so I will deliver sounds, and then measure the nervous system's response to those sounds. Um, 
Our approach is unique in a number of ways. Um, so first of all, it captures the specifics of the sound. So you know, here you'll see a sound wave, and the brain wave that we've elicited from it actually physically looks like the sound wave. And you can take the sound wave, um, actually you can take the brain wave, and play it back and it will sound like the sound wave. So here you go, here's the speech sound. Da. And here is the brain's response to that sound. Da. You'll hear a scale and then the brain's response to the scale. <laughs> Little deep purple. <laughs> So, so, we, so we have a lot to work with, you know, because the pitch, timing, timbre, the aspects that are included in a sound wave like speech and music, we can actually extract and look at um, physiologically. Uh, importantly, these responses are experience dependent, and so they will change based on our experience, um, whether it is um, long term, so the languages we speak, the music we make throughout our lives, uh, whether it's short term, and even just online, our nervous system will change. And of course, the changes that occur um, will be very, very much greater for the things that we spend a lot of time doing, as opposed to the online changes, which are very, very, very subtle. And they're, they're, they're tricky, very tricky to capture. So um, you know, we were looking at, at, at these, these paintings from so many years ago. And when I think about evolution, uh, you know, you're thinking about tens of thousands of years, and I, I'm, I'm operating on a microsecond level. Um, so it's always very hard for me to think about that. But it is easy for me to think about our, our lives as an evolutionary experiment, and the fact that we have the power, based on what we do, uh, to shape our, our nervous system. Um, and music is a really good model for uh, how the nervous system can change with experience. Um, and the slogans that, that will come up again um, and again is this idea that we are what we do um, and that our past shapes our present, which as uh, you know, individuals, I think it really, it, it's scary because it gives us a lot of responsibility about the choices we make for ourselves, our children, and society. Um, so there's been quite a lot of research showing that uh, musicians, um, uh, nervous systems are different from non-musicians and uh, so uh, there are uh, studies showing more gray matter, more white matter, larger cerebellar volume. Um, one of my favorite experiments um, is, is physiologically. So uh, folks have looked at uh, you know, the, the, the brain's representation of the hands, which we know occurs. And uh, if you're a string player, the representation of your dig digits of your left hand are much more um, uh, el elaborate and uh, larger than the representation of the same person of, 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 of the right hand. Um, and so that, that's a, a, nice, a nice demonstration. Um, what do I mean by a musician? In, for the purposes of my talk today, a musician is somebody who continuously plays music um, throughout their lives uh, for a minimum of twice a week for 20 minutes. OK, so you know, a, a hobbyist. Um, and and you know, we have found, and others have found, that musicians have stronger listening and auditory cognitive skills across the lifespan. Um, so why might music enhance processes, language and listening processes that are outside of music? I mean, obviously, a musician's going to be a, a musical specialist. Um, so Ani Patel has his opera hypothesis, which encapsulates this very nicely. Um, o stands for overlap, because there's overlap in the biology and in the sound waves that are common to speech and music. P is the precision that music draws upon, which is much greater than for speech. For speech, we tolerate foreign accents, all kinds of things. But a little change in, 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 in timing or in pitch will uh, have a bad effect on, on, on the listening of music. Emotions, we know, are extremely important. Repetition, uh, we do things again and again. And musical experience will um, in, force you to learn what to pay attention to. So um, if we're looking at 
what are some of the signature enhancements that we can see in musicians. One is hearing in noise, so hearing speech in noise. And it's hard for everyone, but uh, it, it's more difficult even for, for certain populations. Um, and here's this idea, is musicians are good at extracting relevant signals from a soundscape. So, you know, was, was it a harmony line, a melody line? Was the string plucked or bowed? Um, here, the three bops, which you'll find on YouTube, are listening to the sound of their own instruments. So that's something that you have to do as, as, as a musician. And so we wondered, might this skill transfer to another situation, which is picking out your friend's voice in a noisy restaurant. That's picking out a signal out of a complicated soundscape. And, and the answer is resoundingly yes. So um, across the lifespan on standardized tests where individuals, you know, I, I have you listen to sentences and it becomes increasingly noisy in the background and your job is to repeat back the sentences. And people with musical experience are much better at it across the lifespan and interestingly, even if you are an older musician and you have hearing loss, your ability to hear in noise is still better than an older person's uh, ability to hear in noise if they have normal hearing. Um, here are some physiologic examples. Um, I don't have time to play the sound waves, but um, the, the, the brain waves, but you can see that for the musicians, um, noise really hardly disrupts the response at all. But for the non-musicians, in background noise, um, the, the neural activity is very, very much disrupted. OK, so that was hearing a noise. Another aspect of a, a musician's signature is memory. And musical experience um, and training involves the memorization of sound and visual patterns, memorization of auditory motor sequences, just to tune your instrument, so you listen to the sound of the tuning fork, and you have to hold it in your mind while you tune the instrument. Um, if uh, you have a musical idea and I'm going to improvise on it, I have to hold it in my mind in order to improvise upon it. This exercises our auditory working memory, and your auditory working memories are working right now because hopefully you will be remembering what I just said a few minutes ago so that you can process what I'm saying to you right at this moment. That's your auditory working memory. Um, so all of this exercises memory, and it turns out that on standardized measures of auditory working memory, across the lifespan again, musicians, defined by me, um, are, 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 are significantly better at auditory working memory tasks, including older musicians who have hearing loss. Um, and we don't see visual memory um, issues. Okay, rhythm. So, so in speech and in music, rhythm really provides us with, with this map, this temporal map, with signposts as to um, what to pay attention to, what, where's the meaningful information. So, uh, you know, you might pause, uh, you might, uh, in speech, you, you don't think of rhythm as being important, but it's, it's phenomenally important. Um, and the auditory system, so, you know, I, I, I study, I'm a biologist, I study learning, and I study learning primarily through the auditory system, and the auditory system is, is beautiful, and it is, uh, it, is, it is the temporal expert in the brain, and it needs to process temporal events uh, with tremendous precision. Um, so, if I play this sound to you. Okay, so now I'm going to measure the nervous system's response to that conga sound in that situation and in this one. Kind of want to throw up, right? <laughs> but, but, you know, but, but I think this, this kind of gets to the core of, of aesthetics and, and of what this is one aspect of, of, of that the nervous system very, very clearly, automatically responds to. Um, and, 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 and so musicians will use rhythm uh, to great effect. 
uh, and, and, and if we measure the responses to the same sound, whether it's on or off the beat, the nervous system clearly responds to the same stimulus very, very differently. Um, so a way of looking at people's rhythm ability is to um, have them tap along to a beat. And so you know, here is uh, somebody who is very good at tapping along with the beat, and here are data from somebody who's not especially good <laughs> at, at tapping along with the beat. And um, so why is auditory motor synchronization so important? It, it's fundamental to language. We need to synchronize our auditory and our motor systems just to speak. And it turns out that there are really beautiful associations now between language skills and reading ability. So um, if you are a poor reader, it turns out you're not very good at performing this rhythmic task. So there is a very orderly and systematic relationship between reading score and the ability to tap to a beat. Now, if you measure the neural response to sound, we wanted to see if we could understand, well, you know, what is happening? What is the neural underpinning here? Um, here are individual captures of the response to da, and here is an individual who has a very consistent response from trial to trial, and here is an individual who has a rather inconsistent, a jittered response of their auditory system, and it turns out that the better your nervous system is, so this is your auditory system's response to sound consistently, the better you are at tapping to a beat. So we've, we've closed the triangle conceptually um, from, in, from, from this biological perspective. Um, before I finish up with neuroeducation, I want to take a little detour, of talk about aging. So as we get older, uh, our, our brain responses, we know, uh, the, the, just here, this is a young adult, older, you know, it's not as, as musical, and this is just to speech sounds. Um, but what we do know is that pervasively across sensory system, neural timing gets longer. It slows down as we get older. And this is neural timing in a young adult. And this is neural timing to a consonant in speech. So this is the, the timing that's important. If, if I'm trying to understand it, I say, give me the pill or give me the bill. <laughs> right? Um, OK. So this is what happens with aging. What do you think <coughs> happens if you are an older musician? Where do you think your data will lie? So here you have evidence, really, of a younger brain, a biologically younger brain. So another thing, you know what, we just talked about response consistency. As we get older, our brain's response to sound becomes more jitter, but not if you're an older musician. Again, this neural synchrony, synchrony on the order of microseconds, is important in the processing of sound, which has information at the microsecond level. This is what happens when you get older. Here is your older adult musician. And finally, if you look at the neural representation of the harmonics in sound, again, which are important for distinguishing consonants as well as, as timbre and music, um, it gets worse as we get older. But if you are an older musician, you're, you're really pretty good. And you know, so here is the older musician brain response uh, to speech. So uh, that's it for my little detour. Um, and now I'm going to finish up with uh, this topic of, of musical education. Um, so what happens if you stop playing music? Does the brain continue to profit? How many of you played an instrument um, in your childhood? How many of you are still playing an instrument now? Yeah, so, so this is the typical scenario, and one that we really want to understand biologically. Well, what is the impact of that early experience? And we know from animal studies that animals uh, experiences early in life will really impact the adult animal brain. And so how do we look at this in humans? Uh, answer is clearly yes. What we did first is we uh, took some Northwestern students and matched them in every way we could except for the musical experience they had in their childhood. And then we measured their responses to sound. And we found that kids who had about more than five years of, 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 of musical education in their background, they weren't playing now or at, at the time, um, they had larger responses to sound, and they had less neural background noise. 
so a good signal to noise situation and the guys in the middle with the, the middle amount of musical experience fell right in between. So what about older people? So now we are looking at people who have not played music for decades. Did that early music experience actually matter? Um, and so again, here's what happens with aging. Um, if you've had a couple of years of music experience in your childhood, and here with a moderate amount of musical experience in your childhood. So this aspect of sound processing is one that really is affected by experience, musical experience with sound that happened years and years ago. <coughs> so um, this you know, brings us to this is why musical education is so important. And we are in the midst of some neuroeducational projects where we are investigating the impact of music education. All of the work that I've told you up until now has been done on people who are privileged enough to have, uh, have received private instruction. It's usually one-on-one -on -one instruction. But what is the impact of music education delivered in school group settings? And so we're looking at two very successful music programs, one in Chicago Public Schools and another uh, LA's Harmony Project. Um, uh, Margaret Martin, the, 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 the founder of that project, won a presidential award for, for her, her work there. Um, and, and so we are tracking these kids longitudinally. What's important to know about these kids is that they are all from a very low, um, low socioeconomic status. And um, these, these kids are, are from gang reduction zones in LA. Um, and so this brings us to our very first question, which is, um, you know, if we're going to look at the impact of musical experience, let's look at also the impact of poverty. And the way that we did that is, um, so this is our Chicago-based cohort, and 90% of them almost qualify for free lunch. So they're already uh, coming from poor families. And then what we did is we divided the kids simply based on uh, their mom's education. And all of you know that maternal education is a very important index of, of child development. And that kids whose moms have less education, there's this, this, this notion, um, that landmark study, uh, showing that kids whose moms have less education, by the time they're five years have, uh, old, they have heard the 30 million uh, fewer words. Um, and so we, we looked at these kids who are already impoverished um, to begin with, but they simply differed on the education that their moms had. Something's happening here with the sound. Is this a little better? Yeah? OK. Um, so, so what we found, this is what we found. We found, for A of all, that these kids had more neural noise. So in the absence of auditory stimulation, of any stimulation, they just had um, more background noise, like static on your radio. And they responded to the signal less. So that's a catastrophic signal to noise situation. And they had less responses, um, less consistent responses to sound. Um, so we know that the educational impact of poverty is one that the achievement gap widens over the first couple of years. And so we wondered whether music education might be able to offset this. And so these are some of our early findings from our neuroeducational projects. Um, we started with reading scores. These are with our kids out in LA. And uh, they were matched uh, before they went through training. And the group who had no music training, in fact, had the predicted decline in reading scores from second to third grade. And look at the kids who had a year of music. Right? Um, we looked at their ability to remember a beat. So you know they're listening to a beat, they're tapping along, then the beat goes away and they have to keep tapping. Again, the kids who had music training had, they were faster, they, had, they were more accurate. Um, we we're looking at speech and noise, remember? That's an important musician signature, and again, um, no change in the non-musician group, but the kids who had music training, in fact, got better in their ability to hear a noise. And finally, biologically, after one year, we didn't see any changes in our high school kids, but we did see 
that the responses in noise after two years became neurally much more precise and earlier and faster. So um, just to sum things up, uh, we, we, we are what we do. And uh, our past shapes our present. Um, auditory biology is not frozen in time. It's a moving target. And uh, music education, music really does seem to enhance um, communication skills, language skills. Uh, childhood music experience can leave a lasting mark on the adult brain. Auditory processing is shaped by sensory social environmental factors such as poverty. And I think that you know, the poverty findings really strengthen the, the idea of the, the, import, the importance of education, not only for ourselves, but for our children. Um, in enrichment, musical training has an impact. And this, um, our early findings are that school-based group music instruction um, are, are creating um, a, a situation for children that fosters the children to become better, learning, better learners, uh, not only for music, but for other, especially language-based tasks. Um, and you know, we have ways of accessing this information in humans. If, if you're interested in our technology, um, you can uh, learn about it on our website. Um, these are the many folks in my lab who are responsible for the work and our um, funding agencies that we depend on. Um, and I just want to invite you, please, to visit our website. Um, I have a couple of cards on the table back there. Um, but if, if you would, please um, have a look at these slideshows under the, the different research topics, because they are our effort to communicate to, to a broad audience um, our, our discoveries. So you know, you'll see one picture and one line of text that summarizes two years of work. Um, but but you know, you'll, you'll get an overview. And if you want the nitty gritty, you can download the publications. And uh, well, I thank you for your attention. Wow, another great talk. This is fabulous. I may not let us have a lot of question time at the end. I just might let them talk to each other. And then you can talk to them in the reception. This is really wonderful. Um, and now, nominally the discussant, but speaker as well, is Gary Vikan, who spent a number of years uh, as director of Baltimore's Walter Arts Museum. Before that, he was at the museum as assistant director for curatorial affairs and curator of medieval art. I was looking at his bio, and I was really struck by this longish sentence that says, he was trained as a Byzantinist. I didn't know there was such a thing as a Byzantinist. Um, uh, he's published and lectured extensively on topics as varied as early Christian pilgrimage, Medicine and Magic, Icons, The Shroud of Turin, Fakes and Forgeries, Neuroscience and Aesthetics, and Elvis Presley. So with great pleasure, I give you the Renaissance person, Gary Vikan. Thank you, Alan. I'm just here for a few minutes to bridge uh, the gap between the scientists and you, because you get to talk and engage with all of this. I am a neuroscience junkie of sorts, so I was kind of preparing for today, and I got to music and emotion, and studies that connect music and emotion. And I found out that Samuel Barber's Adagio for Strings gets two asterisks for its ability to release dopamine. <laughs> so what did I listen to in my drive down from Baltimore? Adagio for strings, so it made me peaceful and feel good. I felt good about myself until I discovered that I was an old musician with hearing loss. <laughs> I'm serious. I did oboe for eight years, and I got worse from year to year. I got so bad at playing the oboe that the residual effect is such that when she played those two pieces, the second one sounded better to me. 
Uh, what else do I know in life? Uh, that's about it, except I learned something as a museum director. I have an attitude, a point of view, a bias. And that is that what art museums offer is education second and experience first. Education you can get from a book, you can get it in schools, you can get it on the internet, but you cannot get the unmediated aesthetic encounter, the phenomenology of beauty, and the profound impact of a work of art except through direct encounter. So when I combine this kind of neuroscience junkiness that I have, junky, with the emerging notion, which I thought was just the gift of God to me, that there is something called neuroaesthetics. Namely, neuroscientists who are devoting their time to explore the aesthetic experience, which lies at the core of what value an art museum provides. So about six years ago, I made a point to sit, on, on, sit in on a full day of neuroscience presentations at Johns Hopkins University. Johns Hopkins has tons of neuroscientists, a small minority of whom, against their better judgment and the better judgment of those who advise them, and certainly the funders, decide that art is what they want to study. And one of them explained it to me. He says, why study art as a neuroscientist? Because he said, when you're doing art, your brain is running full speed. It's hitting on all eight cylinders. So if you can figure out what's happening to the brain on art, you know a whole lot about the brain. So one of the people I met, and this gets to the point of what you're going to do in about 20 or 25 minutes after you've had at least one glass of wine, ideally two, <laughs> because part of your experience is to put on funny glasses and try out this little bitty exhibition that I curated downstairs with Hillary Morgan. Hillary, where are you? The in-house curator, somewhere here. There you are. And the content of which is Nirja's work. Nirja is over here from Johns Hopkins. My job was to bring those two together in a small exhibition that explores a concept that I was introduced to as an undergraduate at that wonderful Midwestern school, Carleton College in Minnesota, where I took aesthetics as an undergraduate in 1965. And I got to the notion of significant form, which appealed immensely to me because I thought there had to be something that governed the aesthetic experience that was non-culturally defined, non-historically defined, universal in effect. So when I found out that somebody at Hopkins was working with monkeys and putting little bitty wires on their neurons and then exposing them to different views that were derived from Henry Moore sculptures and fine-tuning those neurons and to, am I correct, Nirja? Am I approximately right here? <laughs> Fine-tuning those neurons so that you knew exactly what aspect of the shape of that sculpture that neuron in that monkey's head was firing 100% for. So I came up to Ed after he made his presentation, and I asked him, are you doing this with people? Yes, I'm going to do it with people. You can't put the wires in their heads. You can put them in fMRIs, but really what it boils down to is you show them things and you ask them what they think. So it occurred to me that we could do that in a museum. We could take a museum aesthetic concept, which was new to Ed, and Ed's work with monkeys and neurons and shapes was new to me. But if you combine the two, we created this little show called Beauty in the Brain, the intent of which was to use or to invite the audience to be members of the knowledge creating pool. And that's, in effect, what you're replicating tonight downstairs after the wine. wine. <laughs> so what you're going to do is to put on these glasses, and you're going to look at 10 different boards. And these will be covered with 25 little shapes on each board. And you're going to be asked a very simple question for which there's no right or wrong answer. In other words, which shape appeals to you most and which shape appeals to you least? And once you circle these little things and come to the end of this little project, you'll be invited to compare where you came out against what the results of this experiment were and are. And the results of the experiment as they were performed first on the monkeys, 
Second, on the two or 3,000 people that walked into the Walters Art Museum in the spring of 2010 and put on those glasses and circled those little shapes, and those 24 people or so who looked at 104 shapes for hours on end, 3D eyes on a probably a 36 inch screen in the lab, being paid something like $20 an hour. And finally, the people that went into the FR, fMRI and allowed themselves to have their brains registered as they reacted to the same shapes. And what you'll find in this show is that there is an amazing convergence of all four, or really three. The people that came into the museum liked and disliked the same categories of shapes as the people in the lab, as the people in the fMRIs. But I'll leave that for you to find out and to speculate on, and I offered my own speculation toward the end of the show, what that means of the role of the artist, who the artist is in creating significant form, because Clive Bell was right, Immanuel Kant was right, there is such a thing as significant form. And, and how the artist iterates that, and where you fit into that iteration. So with that, with the knowledge that I was a player of the oboe for eight years, what's one oboe at the bottom of the ocean? A good start. A good start. <laughs> so thank you. Art is certainly informing science, um, and and you know I think just the fact that. Uh, well, what, what, what you said, that uh, when we are engaged in either making music or in um, experiencing art, that it really engages uh, many, many parts of our nervous system. And I, I think that a, a, a direction that science is going in that is, I think, very, very important is the following. You know, for years, um, and we still, I mean, we, we, we are members of these little individual societies, and we study um, little parts of the brain, and uh, you know, there's, there's this compartmentalized view. Um, but of course, the nervous system, uh, nature doesn't respect disciplines. Um, you know, so we know that our, just our sensory system consists of pathways that connect, for example, our ears to our brain. And then there are pathways that are even more massive that connect our brain all the way down to our ears, and then there's the limbic system. So the way you know, sensory, cognitive, and reward systems interact in the brain, and art, I think, teaches us that um, it is this interaction that um, is very much at the basis of how the nervous system works. Yeah, I think there's a tremendous commonality of interest across the fields. Um, I'd like to emphasize, you, you talked about art appreciation, as I did, but performing art, uh, visual art, or sculptural, three-dimensional art, the, the performance of it is itself, is, is something that crosses to music much more comprehensively than, than just the appreciation. So there are very much two aspects, the input and the output aspect. In, in visual art. And uh, as you say, it engages all levels of, the, of, the, of brain processing, uh, you know, extending to the, even to the deeply what one would call spiritual, which is an area that's not been studied much neuroscientifically, but must be represented somewhere in the brain. But I'd like to emphasize that the limbic system is not just a, a reward system, but a whole uh, flow of complex forms of emotion, emotion, emotions of all types, not simply valence of positive or negative reward, but uh, a range of, of structural. And, and you see the complexity of, of the limbic system is such that it can contain all those emotions. I'm going to take a different tack. Uh, what really interests me, besides generally speaking almost everything about neuroscience, <laughs> um, are two kind of extremes. One is public policy, as it's informed by neuroscience. And I think what you've done, Nina, is immensely valuable and important for those of us 
uh, who have been advocates for the arts uh, and public support for the arts. And our toolbox has been pretty lean in terms of what I call persuasive uh, evidence. And you, as a director, me as a director, or anybody who's advocating for public action and public monies for something, needs to believe what they're saying, or they can't say it for very long. And your demonstration, especially of the age residual, against the relatively brief encounter, one to five years. I mean, I did eight years. <laughs> Ooh, ouch. Yeah. Well, think, think, think if you hadn't. Think if I hadn't done that. <laughs> Holy God, where would I be now? I'd be back at Dumbarton Oaks studying Byzantium. I'd be a Byzantium. The other thing, though, is experiments. And I'd love to do, an, for these two people, because we already spoke, I already spoke with Christopher about something that would achieve that sweet spot where it's both an exhibition, something you look at, and an, an experiment, something you're involved with, <laughs> and a knowledge-creating setting. And I even have thought of one. You ready? Is there something in your music brain analogous to significant form? Yes. Say that again. <laughs> Is there something in your music brain analogous to the visual brain significant form? Yeah. So you know what we've what you've shown with the the music the the uh, visual art work is that um, the nervous system prefers certain things and that you know there are commonalities and that artists will use what the nervous system will gravitate to to advantage. In music, um, I can just off the top of my head think of two things. One is a rhythm example that I showed you. Uh, I mean, it, it, you don't have to have musical experience to um, be able to perceive, babies will perceive rhythm in, in sounds. And so, of course, uh, musicians and composers will use rhythm and rhythmic variations to enormous advantage. The other is um, you know, this notion of consonant and dissonant. And so what makes sounds consonant and dissonant? And it's, it's based on, on, on it's, 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 it's physics. It's uh, you know, the, the, the fact that there are um, harmonic ratios. You know, why is it that in music, one, four, five chords are used a lot? Because the uh, harmonic ratios of those sounds are, they're simple. They're simple ratios that the nervous system will just automatically, neurons are born to phase lock. They will, they will, they will lock to, um, to, to elements of sound that are harmonically simple very easily. And the elements of sound that um, are, are, are um, partials and, and elements of the harmonics um, that are not as simple. Again, um, you, musicians use this to great advantage because it is this contrast uh, between what the nervous system will um, automatically very easily uh, lock onto, I mean, and truly lock onto. I mean, we see neurons phase locking to phase uh, in cycles of sound. Um, and the way in which the nervous system then will deviate from that is something that, that we learn and we learn to appreciate. Um, and so this all stems from inherent characteristics of sound and of um, how certainly the auditory system works. So I've heard one thing and think another. Uh, they're not contradictory. The first thought is to extend the ratio, music, harmonics, to architecture. And there you've got a construct that's very old, uh, Palladian villas, uh, which build on Vitruvian architectural principles, are based on simple harmonics. And if you could construct an experiment of a spatial thing where you are both Palladian in the simplicity of space and the comfort you get from it, and Daniel Liebitzkin, who screws with your head, in violating those relationships. I assume that's sort of what you're talking about, right? Very much. Um, 
maybe the answer is so obvious and it's already there. It was not an obvious answer and it was not already there when we did significant form, when we explored that idea. It just sort of hung up there as an intellectual conceit. But you've already provided a kind of common sense answer, namely a child is seeking simplicity of sound relationships. Yeah. I think I heard that. Well, yeah, and the nervous system does <coughs> seek these simplicities of sound relationships and, and babies will, will prefer uh, certain to listen to certain sounds, but you learn mm -hmm. to, uh, to appreciate all kinds of sounds and the way in which the sounds deviate from these uh, simpler harmonic ratios are, are, are you know, elements of music that are fabulous. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, vi visually, the harmonic ratios have been studied quite a lot in, in psychophysics, uh, so that the comparable studies to the, the auditory resonances have been done in, in a certain sense. But I'd like to take it to a, another level in the music domain. Uh, you, you asked for, for significant form, and it, it seems to me at the level slightly above this issue of the harmonic relationships. Um, and it's what I understand musicians to call a riff. So a riff is, is a, a little musical structure which hits you just right. It's, it's, there's music and then there's the riffs which stand out as special uh, musical forms that must have that significant quality. I don't know what it is you know, that makes something a riff and not a riff, but I would say that's mm -hmm. more the level that r relates to what you're talking about in terms of significant form. Interesting. So I feel a little bit compelled to open up to the, the audience because we are going to stop at seven, exactly. So if you'd rush to the microphones, remember, remember the principle, right? No preambles, no long Tone whatever. Tone goes up at the end. Short, yeah, voice up. But, but if you would say who you are. There's one public policy point I, I don't want to let let go of, and, and I think it's, it's tremendously important from what we've heard tonight. There's kind of a piece from, from each of our speakers, and, and that is, first of all, although it may seem obvious after the fact that the brain should be responding as you would predict mm -hmm. from the, mo the sensory modality and the emotional experience, you actually, for the first time, are seeing it, and that should never be underestimated just because one said it feels a little bit obvious. The, the public policy point that Dr. Vika made, I think, is an extremely important one and should not get lost. So it's not only that it makes us feel good mm -hmm. to do aesthetic enrichment early in life. It actually helps. Yeah. And, and that point is... Yeah, it's important. I don't want us to lose it. Okay, we're going to take these three questions, see how we're doing in time. You go first. Who are you anyway? <laughs> well, hello. I'm one of your fellows. My name is Rachel Britt. I'm a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow. Where? And the word, yes? Where? At the NIH. I've heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> So the word plasticity came up in at least one of your presentations, and I'm really curious about the benefits on the elderly of, say, taking up drawing or sculpture or revisiting musical instruments or visiting museums. Is there scientific evidence to support the um, benefits in older brains of visiting or practicing art? Well, I, I can tell you from uh, the auditory domain, so um, we have, have completed some studies where um, older adults went through um, computer-based auditory training, um, and uh, this is a brain, brain fitness program that uh, engaged both sensory and cognitive systems, and, and you know, we were looking to see whether there would be improvements, uh, enhancements in you know, important things that, that are um, declining as we get older. One is hearing a noise and the other is working memory and, and then the third is, is, is importantly what is the biological effect. And uh, so in, in a paper that, uh, that was uh, published in, in, in PNAS, 
um, we reported um, modest findings that, uh, you know, in fact, older adults for eight weeks when they engage in this activity uh, for 40 minutes a day and we uh, had an active control, uh, that, 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 that this active activity really, in fact, uh, mattered vis-a-vis -vis how the brain changed and communication skills. Now, the question that you asked is, what about music? What about art? And so, um, you know, we, we know that there is impact of early music experience later in life. What we don't know, an unanswered question <coughs> from a biological standpoint, there is some evidence from a uh, behavioral standpoint, but, um, you know, for biologists, from a biological standpoint, uh, to my knowledge, there, uh, um, this is a question that has no answer, and a question that, uh, well, I, I submitted a grant that was supposed to be reviewed two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> On. Um, so, so, you know, God help us to, to, would, to find the answer. But I was what, assured by NIH this morning that they're speeding up the catch yeah. up on the reviews. Okay. So I hope that helps. Just what, one tiny thing. I mean, I, I, I just, my scientific gut feeling is, you know, and this is why the science needs to be done, because we don't know for sure. But if kind of a lame computer based program, you know, by comparison to art and music, can engender changes in the nervous system and in communication, I, I can't but imagine that the arts wouldn't be a more effective way. But, you know, as you said, you know, that we have so little in the way of outcomes, data, and ironclad biological evidence for the effects of experience in society, whether it's education as children or as adults. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Just, just briefly, I can't resist telling you about my mother who, when she retired, found Uncle George's cello in, in the attic that was decomposing, and she took it to a, a musical instrument repair class, which is an evening class, the kind of thing that happened in England. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we can encourage she repaired the cello and took up the cello, and pretty soon she had a coterie of young men coming over <laughs> weekly to play quartets with her, which went, she continued to do until the uh, age of, I think, 98, just wow. before she died. Whoa. Here, here. <laughs> I like it. Is she playing tonight? <laughs> um, OK, please. Who are you? Hi, I'm uh, Bill O'Brien. I'm Senior Advisor for Program Innovation at the National Endowment for the Arts. And um, I've seen Nina's stuff quite a few times. Um, I just want to. I hope you're funding it. What's that? No, nothing. Go ahead. Uh, we're working on it. Um, the, uh, I, I just want to add the, in terms of um, arts and older populations, um, and I think Nina participated. We ha uh, did a workshop that was co hosted by National Academies of Sciences um, last fall, uh, specifically focused on arts and well being and health and aging populations. And, uh, if you go to our website and look at research, you'll find white papers that are being released as that goes, goes along. But what I was going to mention is... Um, no, what you're going to ask. What I'm going to ask, <laughs> yeah, is um, we've been involved with uh, also some partnerships with the Department of Defense looking at PTSD and accelerating health and different uh, kinds of um, <laughs> arts interventions, music, um, writing, and visual arts. And what we're finding is that there's a learning component that's really important there. And we're also um, now talking to the National Science Foundation and um, National Endowment for the Humanities on co-investigating uh, some of these things. So creativity um, as a plasticity and as a, as a competency that is developed through either music training or um, music exposure. Um, so I, I guess my question coming back and <laughs> is that do you, from your different points of view, uh, see evidence of there being uh, the capability, the competency to be creative, to, um, to be able to make associations that haven't been memorized, uh, some of those types of things that build plasticity? Yeah. Well, let me take it first. Uh, the Dr. Lick of a study was very compelling in that regard of how important this art training was, particularly to these blind individuals. Almost every one of them said words to the effect, this is so exciting, this is going to change my life. Just a week of this experience of, of a, a new, uh, opening a new domain, a new world 
of exploration. I don't know if it actually did change their, their lives, but the point is there was a tremendous emotional boost from the specifically artistic experience that you would, they wouldn't have gained just from learning some uh, sort of scientific figure, just, just the, the straight training itself. The, the, the extra levels that are brought, brought in by art seem to be tremendously important to humans as, as agents in this sort of thing. Uh, well, some of you may know Charles Lim at Hopkins, uh, who's a neuroscientist who's very interested in creativity and the riff, in effect, the riff. Uh, and he put uh, jazz pianists into fMRIs and watched what happened in terms of loss of certain control structures, inhibiting structures, and the release of other things under the heading of creativity. And then he put rap artists in and found differentials very clear differentials if they were repeating a rap that had been recorded that they'd done before and one that they were just having to do on the spur of the moment. And then he put caricaturists. Cal, who does The uh, Economist, used to be at, uh, at uh, the Baltimore Sun, put him in an fMRI <laughs> and had him do a caricature of somebody in the room in real time and the same creative processes were going on in all three. So you probably are aware of some of that stuff, maybe all of it for yeah. that matter. Very cool, can, okay, can, quick. Can I add two, yeah. two little things? One is you know, about appreciating art. Uh, the, you know, in terms of the profound effects of musical experience on the nervous system, you actually have to do it, uh, not just listening. And I, I like to say you're not gonna get physically fit watching spectator sports. <laughs> <laughs> The other point is... is what are mirror neurons for it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and the other has to do with aesthetics. So, you know, we are, we've been talking about what feels good, but I think what is equally important is what feels bad. And certainly, you know, for, for, for music and, and engaging in a, a creative endeavor like that, an active endeavor, you have to have enormous tolerance for, for punishment and for frustration. And uh, you know, deliberate practice is hard. Witness me in the oboe. <laughs> Go ahead, please. This will be the last question. I'm sorry, but yeah. Um, I'm Linda Reinish. I'm a musician and a former arts administrator. Um, uh, and thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, I'm just wondering what happens when you add um, movement to the mix, as in dance, where you have the visual and the auditory what happens to the brain when you add that component, and is there also a lot of research being done in that area? Yeah, um, so again, so, so the, the field of music and neuroscience is really a very young one, um, and uh, the, 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 the question of, of rhythm and biological effects uh, is one that really has not been systematically investigated, uh, and, and one that, that should be, uh, and um, it, it, it is a little bit difficult sometimes to find um, dancers that don't have musical, some musical training and experience, but it, it certainly can be done, and it should be done. Um, and I think that I'll leave it at that. So let me um, give each of you a moment for the last word. Uh, anything you'd like to add to what we've spoken about? This has been a fabulous evening. Just really a wonderful uh, set of discussions. Last I'll add thought. one thing. Good. Go ahead. I read this in the New York Times Sunday before last. A guy, neuroscientist at Emory, I told you this story, didn't I? Put his, trained his dog to go into an fMRI. Did anybody read that? Was I the only one? Come on. And so he found that the dog's uh, brain, caudate, or whatever that part of the brain is, that gives anticipatory pleasure, you know, he's going to get a biscuit or his master's coming in the room or something like that, behaved in a way so similar to humans that he was advocating for public policy changes in puppy mills and dog racing as an expression of personhood for dogs. So put that in your pipe and smoke. <laughs> That just gave me an anxiety attack. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, just you don't have to follow him. <laughs> I mean, 
actually, I, I think I, I do want to say that, that there is something that is, um, that, 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 that is unique about rhythm that not all animals have. And you know, it really, Do any it, it really well, vocal animals. So, so parrots and uh, some uh, seals and echolocating animals. Um, but for the most part, you know, people have really tried very hard um, to train monkeys, for example, to anticipate a beat. Um, and it's very, very, very difficult uh, for for for, for, that, for that to happen. And you know, there's speculation that this uh, rhythmic ability. Um, is, is really tied to Language. this intersection between the auditory and the motor system that's involved in, in speaking. Yeah, that makes sense. Chris? Well, I would just like to say that neuroscience in general works with, with very constrained paradigms, very scientific paradigms that are, uh, mitigate against exploring these artistic things. And it's, it's quite difficult to, to generate something that's acceptable as a neuroscientific study, and it still captures the full flavor of the artistic experience. But I think we're seeing way, beginning to see ways of really doing this effectively, and I'm hoping that this kind of event can really lead to a burgeoning of, of these kind of studies and, and uh, go I, on to greater things. I want to second that. I, I think that we tonight, saw the, uh, the bringing to bear sort of the scientific approach to understanding what people like you have known forever, which is that in fact the, the artistic experience, whether you're doing it or, or observing it, in fact uh, is as you've thought it to be, a combination of a sensory and an emotional event, and that the emotional event is as grounded in biological reality, as is the sensory event. So let's thank them. They were fabulous. <laughs>